Okay. Since this is uh, also an exam review, the first thing is I'm not going to rush through it. We got through the first two readings yesterday, and those first two readings were as far as we got out of four. So I decided to make today exam review day one, and next class exam review day two. So this is your homework right now, all right? A period, this applies to you too. Readings one and two take you through your Wikipedia entry and your first three diary entries. Diary one was Origins of the French Revolution. Diaries two and three were Revolution the Moderate Stage. Those are readings, right? Now, what your diaries are, theoretically, is you showing us that you have read and learned the history. And at the same time, enjoy the creativity. The creativity is easy. Oh, look, I'm a French peasant. The showing that you understand history is not easy. And that is what this exam review should also help you do. So I want you to listen as we go through this. One half of your ear as the character you are. The other half of your ear as other characters that you are interacting with. And take notes on details that, especially if you think, ask yourself right now, are my diaries really weak on showing an understanding of the main events of the French Revolution? If the answer in your head is yes, all I'm doing is making a character who is fun and creative, but I'm not showing any sort of history, then decide right now, I'm going to be taking notes of details that I can just insert into my diaries between now and uh, the test day, which has been pushed back a day two. Understand? For diaries one through three and your Wikipedia, this is the time to catch details, historical details, that maybe you didn't get from the readings. And, and just go and hit your wiki, revise, add those details. It does not mean start all over. It means add a few touches. You know, it's like an artist. Oh, I think I'll add a little red. He doesn't start the whole painting over. Add details. Um, so just diaries one through three right now. It's all on the wiki, but I can't show it. OK, I will put this PowerPoint online. <laughs> um, or give, actually, I'll give you a link to it, because I stole it from a teacher in New York. She's great. Why make another one? All right, William, uh, um, Matt, I want you to be my what? I want you to be my button guy when I say button. Uh, one last announcement. I use Digo. Those of you who, who are, good for you, because you won't regret it. Those of you who are not, for right now, I don't care. But if I have a paper, uh, a research paper due on communism in three years, I have already, as I've read online articles about communism, highlighted them and commented on them and saved them on Digo. So I can hit my communism tab, and there I've already got 10 articles with citations and all that sort of thing with the highlighted quotable parts and my notes right there. It is a smart tool for your future. Now, you want to be resistant, you want to think that you know better than teacher, go ahead. Those of you who are smarter, Learn from somebody who's trying to make you more powerful than those who don't want to learn, all right? Digo is very powerful for research. If you are ever doing research online, use it and save that stuff to Digo because it's there for the rest of your life. Stuff you read this year could be ready for you to do as a source for research papers in college. Don't be stupid. Be smart. All right. Um, is that it? Oh, so my Digo account. You can make your highlights and sticky notes private or public. Mine have been private so far because I, don't want, I didn't want you cheating by just looking at my stuff. My job is to make you learn how to work, learn how to read, learn how to understand what you read. Not to just treat you like babies who can't read and tell you everything. That's why I don't like what I'm doing right now. Because I'm telling you what you've read. If you need to hear what you've read, you are not a good reader. You need to work harder at reading. Because in the real world, you're not going to have people telling you what you read. If you need that, you better work hard. Because otherwise, you're going to get left behind by those who can read well. All right, anyway, so I have made my Digo highlights for all the readings. That means the stuff that I outlined and my notes. Public. So if you turn your Digo on, you can go home, go to our readings, and you will see all of my highlights and all of my notes. All right? OK, any questions? All right. OK, so here we go. This is. Um, 
a PowerPoint that basically covers readings one and two, the origins of the French Revolution and the moderate stage. All right? And it's called the French Revolution bourgeois phase. Notice, the bourgeoisie were the ones who were moderate. They were the ones who controlled the government until Robespierre and the Terror came in, in the what, 1792. So this is, this is readings one and two. Matt, go. All right, we're going to start with the monarchy. Again, you can tell me now. How many estates are there? Three. What's left out besides the three estates? What else was there in France? Monarchy. The monarchy. So let's start with the monarchy. Notice, this is valuable. You want to put realistic details for your ant farm diaries? Look at these pictures, these paintings. They give you all sorts of details. Think of yourself as a, as a novel writer. You are writing a historical fiction novel. You need details. Hello, there's a million of them. Steal, borrow, cheat, don't cheat. All right, so there is Marie Antoinette, foxy lady. And there is Louis XVI, one of the greatest kings ever to live. That's irony. Next. Next. Marie Antoinette's Peasant College. Cottage. Um, I think this is near Versailles. You've seen, uh, if you've gone to any of the secondary sources, look where this woman lived. Oh, my little quaint peasant cottage. This is probably worth, you know, I don't know, half a million dollars. Nice little pond there, etc. So this is a kind of life she lived in. She preferred this over this more palatial house. Um, setting, <coughs> details. Marie Antoinette, where are you? Marie Antoinette? Setting, details. All right, next. 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 <laughs> she never really said it, this woman says. I believe her. She's, she's been teaching history longer than I have. Um, but this is how people talked about her, nicknames they had for her. Madam Deficit. Deficit means national debt, government debt. We don't have enough money to pay our debts off as a government. Well, why? Because she liked to buy million dollar bracelets, million dollar necklaces. All that tax paying money was going to this lovely thing. They also called her the Austrian whore because she was a member of the Austrian nobility. Not the nobility, the Austrian royalty, monarchy. She was related to the king of Austria Hungary. Um, so, that's why Louis married her, so he would have allies in Austria, the Austrian Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. So that's why they called her the Austrian whore, because she's marrying into Louis, the Bourbon monarchy, uh, in order to, you know, have more necklaces. Marrying into money, a whore. All right, next. Okay, next. 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 Stop. All right, Crane Brenton is a great, great historian, 20th century historian. And this woman was nice enough to take out the main ideas that Brenton shared about revolutions in general and how the French Revolution shows us some general laws of revolution. Notice this stuff doesn't say conditions present before the French Revolution occurred. In general, conditions present before any revolution occurs. We will see this pattern repeated over and over. So think about this for the future because, geez, we have a lot of revolutions coming. We have the Russian Revolution, 1917 and 1905. We have the Chinese Revolution, 1911 and 1949-50. We have a lot of revolutions coming. This pattern is, uh, will repeat itself over and over. It only makes sense. People are people around the world, right? So, one, people from all social classes are discontented, unhappy. Two, people feel restless. I'm nervous. I'm restless. I'm, I, I'm, I'm stressed. And they're held down. I could do things, but I'm not being allowed to. What are they held down by? Unacceptable restrictions in society. There are laws, there are traditions, there are customs that keep them held down. Not just the society, but also the religion. The church is holding me down. The economy, the taxes are holding me down. The government, the laws are holding me down. They have hope for the future, but they're being forced to accept less than they had hoped for. Why would we have hope for the future in the 1700s, think of last semester? Why would we have hope for the future in the 1700s, think of last semester, please? No wrong answers? Come on, be Western. Jessica's out of hand, I can't see. Yeah? Um, like the enlightenment? 
Good. They enlighten them what? Like it caused them to like um, kind of like lose, um, kind of see that there are like, more answers. Yeah, the enlightenment. Can you guys be quiet, please? Don't be teacher. The enlightenment. Yes, remember Locke's ideas, the ideas of all of the philosophers. Individual rights, equality, the right to my own property, the freedom from the church, all of these things, the idea of progress, a modern idea. Tradition is on the way out, and instead the idea of progress is on the way in. So they have hope about that. And they're beginning to think of themselves, people are beginning to think of themselves as belonging to a social class. I belong to the third estate. I belong to the second estate. I belong to the first estate. But there's a growing bitterness, tension, hatred between all of those classes. Next. Strangely, the social classes that are closest to each other's other are the ones that hate each other the most. Next. Who cares? I'm not going to um, go too long in the stop stop. The scholars and the thinkers, the philosophers, the humanists, the philosophes, they start giving up on the traditional ways. They just, you know, we've tried hard enough to make this work. It doesn't work. Let's face the facts. We need to change things. Down with the old. The government doesn't respond because the government is the old. I want to keep my job in the government. I want to keep my privileges in the government. I'm not going to cooperate with this. And so the leaders of the government and the ruling class also start doubting themselves. Because, geez, look, they just stormed the Bastille. 20,000 people just marched on the king's palace in Versailles. Of course you're going to start doubting yourself. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Strangely, George W. Bush doesn't seem to doubt himself, although like 70% of the American population is voting against him and saying, oh, horrible, horrible, but he doesn't doubt himself. Most leaders do when they have that much evidence. And when they start doubting themselves, those of you in first and second estate, those of you even in the bourgeoisie, they start joining the other groups. There were aristocrats who were saying, you know what, this system does stink. I'm going to join the progressives. I'm going to join the liberals, the philosophes, the new ideas, the revolutionaries. Next. And the government, Louis, can't get enough support from any of these people to save his own skin. So these are, again, conditions before any revolution occurs. Next. Obvious, we know that debt is what caused the French Revolution, the main cause. Louis was in so much debt that he could not get the finances to avoid going bankrupt as in the government has no money and it's, in, it's got such a bad record of paying off its debt that, it will, uh, that anybody will give it anymore. So what do we start doing? Raising taxes beyond what the people will accept. Next. This is a really good slide. Remember, you do have an essay test. Your essay test is, and I put the, the essay question on the wiki. This whole year, it's called Modern World History. What does this add to the birth of the modern, this world that we live in? that is new. We've seen the fall of the medieval in terms of theocracy, the Catholic Church ruling, in terms of uh, science and worldview, the scientific revolution. What is this at? That's your essay question for, I think, Thursday for you guys. Look at this. Land ownership by social category on the eve of the French Revolution. The clergy. 2% of the population, the first estate, 2% of the population, they owned up to 10% of the land. Churches, monasteries. The nobility, 1.5% of the population owned 25% of the land. I'll put this up here so you can, you can see this. Go back to it. The bourgeoisie, the rich third estate people, the business people, professionals, doctors, lawyers. 8.4% of the population owned one-third of the land. The other 87% owned up to 45% of the land. So let's put it together. The richest classes owned 10, 35, 65%, but they were only 8, 9, 11% of the population. But they owned 60% of the land. 11% owned 